the battleship Iowa. It's one of the most amazing battleships I've ever seen. Ready to steam into battle, it's 57,000 tons of iron, steel, crew, ammunition, and supplies. When you strip out the non-essentials, it's 48,000 tons of pure iron and steel. That's a mountain of metal. A short while back, two guys decided to move it from San Francisco, where it had been holed up, all the way down to San Pedro in California and turn it into a museum for the people. In 1992, I attended the decommissioning of the world's last battleship, sister of the USS Iowa, the USS Missouri, here in Long Beach, California. And, uh, you know, the emotions that fled over me that day as we were all witnessing an end of an era. Um, about a hundred years, a century that the battleships roamed the seas, and this was going to be the last one decommissioned. And I could just see the emotions in the crew. There was about 10,000 visitors there, and I could just, a lot of them were past battleship sailors. And I really was emotionally drawn by the fact that this was the very last battleship ever to sail the seas. The mighty new battleship Iowa has now joined the United States Navy in active duty. In pictures just released, Made during the 45,000-ton warship's testing cruise, the Iowa's commander, Captain McCrae, orders her nine 16-inch guns to fire a mighty salvo. Anti-aircraft batteries open up, a powerful contribution to the United Nations Navy. Slickham is readily launched from surface ships. This armored box launcher is on the battleship New Jersey. CGN 9, 36, and 38 class cruisers, plus DD 963 class destroyers like the USS Merrill, are also receiving Tomahawk capability. When the ship uh, went to the Baltic Sea, to put on a firing demonstration for the Russian Navy, the uh, uh, Admiral Gorchkov witnessed the firing demonstration and supposedly he said, you Americans don't know what you have in these ships. We could shoot everything we have at it and just bounce off or have little effect. And then we'd see you coming over the horizon and, and you would sink us. But, uh, and they said, what are we spending all this money for a super Navy that went out to Greenland and now it just takes America to reactivate four museum pieces to drive us back. <laughs> that was the end of the Cold War. We won. It was the Iowa class that really gave me the butterflies and really um, made me interested in, in the history of them and the dynamics of them. In 1994, when I formed the Iowa Class Preservation Association, the first thing I did was get a map of the United States and I plotted with circles every museum ship that had been donated by the Navy since the 50s. And it was real clear to see that the East Coast was loaded with naval museum ships. And the West Coast only had a few little tiny ones at that time. Um, and when I did an analysis of the four Iowa-class battleships, where they would probably end up, uh, I was correct of most of them. The New Jersey and the Missouri was in um, decommissioned and in storage up in Bremerton, Washington, Washington State on the West Coast. And the Wisconsin and the Iowa was in Philadelphia Navy Yard at that time on the East Coast. It was pretty clear early on that the Wisconsin was going to get into Norfolk. And they actually set her up right next to the Nauticus Museum downtown Norfolk. The New Jersey, which was in Washington State, we pretty were sure that she was going to go to her home state, New Jersey, which she did. The Missouri, where the end of World War II was signed on her decks, it seemed likely that she was going to go to Pearl Harbor. And that happened. 
My grandmother passed away in uh, March of 99, I want to say. March of 99 and March of 2000, maybe March of 2000. Um, and my grandfather, I didn't know him very well. And nobody knew my grandfather very well. And so I called my grandpa and said, what do you want to do? You know, what, what would you like to do now that you've lost your wife of almost 60 years? What do you want to do? And uh, he said he wanted to go see his ship that he served on. And I said, okay, let's go see your ship. And what's your ship? And he said it was the USS Missouri, which was in Pearl Harbor. So we flew out to Pearl Harbor and spent about a week on the ship. And I saw a, at that point, 80 some odd, early 80 year old man turn into an 18 year old man again, into a kid. And, and uh, you know, the stories that came out and the tears and the, the camaraderie and the, um, you know, hanging out on Waikiki Beach with my grandfather, he ended up becoming a friend and not my grandfather anymore. And uh, it was kind of a touching thing. It really was a very touching thing to me. The only one that we were unsure of was the USS Iowa. And she was on the East Coast with as many museum ships up and down the East Coast already. It was oversaturated for a large ship. We thought likely she was going to get scrapped. Her only salvation probably was to come to the West Coast. But to go through the Panama Canals, it was like a $4 million uh, tow. It's hard enough getting money just to get the ship towed from wherever she's at, close to a proximity of her final permanent birth site. But to add another $4 million to a project for a nonprofit was probably not going to happen. But if there was any battleship, it was the Iowa that we thought could make it to the West Coast. And oddly enough, it was, from what I understand, it was a handshake with Diane Feinstein agreeing with Senator John Warner of Virginia that they would spend three and a half million dollars to get the Wisconsin berth next to the Nauticus Museum in storage for the three and a half million to tow the Iowa to San Francisco. And that handshake basically was what got the Iowa out here to the West Coast and ultimately saved as a museum ship. It was a hot topic. You had naval gunfire support. Uh, it was NGFS at that point with a guy named Bill Stearman, William Stearman, great man. Uh, he's actually on our advisory board today. And he was really focused on, uh, his group was really focused on making sure that we do not lose the shore bombardment capability of the 16-inch 50 caliber guns. The USS Iowa's main distinguishing feature is its 16-inch guns. The firepower unequaled in the world. Even today, if, if a Navy had to come up with a ship, it would be very difficult for it to, under, to be able to create a ship and manufacture a ship the caliber of the Iowa. And the caliber of the Iowa's guns, the 16-inch guns, is what's distinguished it. It's particularly special to Marines when you're conducting an amphibious operation to be able to have a reliable weapon system that fires accurately, timely, and responsibly to a Marine's requirements ashore. And when Marines are landing ashore, nothing like a, a battleship to provide that kind of firepower. So whether it's in World War II or Korea, both those conflicts, the Iowa and the other battleships, the U.S. Navy provided unequaled fire support. Off the Korean coast in 1951, the shells span out explosively from the barrels in salvos and broadsides, the pinpoint shore installations, and the new enemy in foxholes among the Kaesong Hills. When the ship first was brought here a couple, three years ago, I was here when it was towed in, and I talked to an old gentleman who had a white Navy uniform on, and he was in his uh, tie and hat, had tailor made. I said, sir, when did you serve? He said, 1944. And I said, I served in 54, and I got to tell you a story. And he said, what is it? I said, I was at Combat Information Center, and we fired 4,500 rounds of 16-inch projectiles in Korea, twice as many as the ship did in World War II. He responded, well, Sonny, I guess we can say that we hit what we shot at. <laughs> Um, for many folks, if you remember the bunker-busting bomb debate in 2005, that was driving. The Iowa and the Wisconsin being on donation hold was driving some of that conversation um, because we didn't have the weapon technology to be able to, to penetrate 30 feet of reinforced concrete. And so the Marine Corps was very concerned by it, obviously. The Marine Corps, and this is my understanding from behind the scenes, the Marine Corps was very concerned about losing that capability. Um, but the Navy, these are, these are large, steel, expensive ships to maintain. 
And, uh, and so in the navies, you know, the more money they're spending on maintaining an old battleship or an old carrier or something in, in mothballs, the less money they have to keep the active fleet moving. And, and so it's completely understandable from a business approach to look at that. But the Marine Corps didn't want to lose the shore bombardment capability of the Iowa. So that conversation was going uh, on as high up as Congress. And so the legislation was written for the Iowa to come to California, but it was also written to say when it's donated, it, it still will be maintained with cathodic protection dehumidification in case the Navy ever needed it. And it was also discussed all the way till 2020 it would receive that. In addition, modifications to the ship were not permitted that could not be turned back in a shipyard within a 72 hour time period. The ship was put in storage at a place that normally doesn't take care of vessels of this size or this condition in a mobilization status at class B means the ship should be able to be returned to service very quickly. So she really wasn't in a place like Bremerton where the Missouri and New Jersey was at or on the East Coast uh, where the Wisconsin was stored at Norfolk Navy Yard where they actually had a lot of staff, a lot of money that they could take, maintain them each year. So we did see a tremendous amount of degradation of the ship on the outside and even some of the water got on the inside in a couple of spaces. Bremerton did send down a team and they actually got her watertight again, but it was really sad to walk on the ship and it had been so many years since she had gone out of commission, it was sad that we couldn't get out our paintbrushes and start slapping some paint on her just to protect her. I didn't actually get honored to do the first inspections till maybe late 2004, early 2005. Um, we started doing inspections for our museum application, for our museum ship application. Um, and so when I got on board, I mean, it was, it was butterflies. It was really emotional. You know, here you have a ship um, that hasn't seen service for years. You know, the Navy maintained her, the Marad maintained her to the point that she wasn't going to fall apart, but still that's just enough. I mean, she was rusted, her decks were falling apart, and so it was very emotional. Um, but it was exciting. It was exhilarating to start working on it, of course. Around the same time of all of this, of course, San Francisco, um, we were working with San Francisco to get her placed on the San Francisco waterfront. And the Port of San Francisco brought up the, the vote to the commission to do so, and the commission sent the vote on to the city council or the city supervisors. And, uh, and frankly, we brought that vote up to the city supervisors and it was voted down, and it was voted down at the time um, because the Iraq war was fairly recent. Um, and Iraq, Afghanistan, one of those two, I think it was Iraq because it was 2005, was a fairly recent conversation and San Francisco didn't back that, that uh, agenda, the political agenda. So they felt that a big gunship such as a battleship Iowa was probably not the statement that they wanted to make um, in their city. And uh, so unfortunately they, they voted it down and putting in the city and started a media storm that many people saw, which was more, the, more of a media storm, frankly, than what really occurred. Years uh, would go by and unfortunately the Vallejo group was never able to perfect their application. They were never able to obtain the money that they needed to convince the Navy they could get it. They didn't finish their environmentals. And even the location that they had, uh, they kind of lost that to a scrapping company. So they seemed to be going backwards over the few years after we left them. Uh, and then in 2009, we realized that in order to save the ship, we probably were gonna have to step up and change our mission from actually helping other groups to actually form another group and actually go after the ship ourselves. Brian Moss called in December of 2008 to the 800 number we had set up for that and um, reached Robert's girlfriend, Trish and said, why aren't you going for the Iowa? I mean, I really had no clue what I was about to get into. And then as soon as we got there, you know, I, I walked on board the ship and I was just so impressed and, and the rest was history. I mean, I, I did not realize how much work uh, that was gonna be involved in saving the Iowa. So it, it's been an adventure for sure. We started in 2009, right after the scrapyard up in Vallejo, um, obtained the pier area that they were gonna put the Iowa. And we started putting feelers out here in the port of Los Angeles. And I believe it was in September of 2009 that we actually wrote a letter. I wrote a letter to the port executive director indicating if they were interested in the battleship Iowa on their waterfront, and if they were interested, then I would then contact the Navy and let the Navy know that there was interest, another group that would like to acquire the Iowa. 
and see if we can't reopen the bidding process and allow us to go for the ship. And initially the Port of LA was definitely interested in this project and things seemed to be moving along pretty well. Um, however, in March of 2010, just about five months later, I got a letter from the Port of LA that basically said no to the project. You build it one brick at a time. I, I call it a one brick philosophy. Um, we started working with a bank um, to explore a loan and they were willing to explore the loan so that showed we had interest and desire from a, a bank which showed enough desire for the Navy and the, the port to realize we're really serious about what we're doing. Robert would worry. I mean there was moments where I just kept thinking, you know, how are we going to do this? And and then when he started to, you know, honey, we have to go to the bank and we're going to take our money out, our retirement money and, and all the credit cards he was using. I mean, I never complained. I never said, oh, my God, what are you doing? You know, I or, you know, I, I just supported him. I knew I had to do it because maybe it's like Robert. I just felt that that it was going to be okay at the end. And even if we didn't get our money back, I knew that there were thousands of people that we were going to make very happy, and, and in fact, we have. When you stop and you look at this ship, it's different. You know, you, you don't see the, uh, I mean, this, this is the ultimate ship. And I'm sure the other three ships do the same thing. And when they built these ships, it just, it's just really awesome, you know. And it's a well-built ship. Um, I was working for Google at the time I was commuting on the train and I would uh, I would take the Capitol Corridor across the bridge right over the Ghost Fleet and see the ship every single day as I went to work. You know, I used to look down at the ship and I would think, I am never going to set foot on her again. Um, I built this beautiful poplar wood box that said USS Iowa on the top of it to deliver the application because for me everything is generally perception. I know that, that folks on perception and so the better that we we deliver something that really made us look above and beyond, the better off we were. As the months went by, um, right after we received that no uh, from the port of LA, uh, yeah, that's kind of dashed our hopes. I'm about to give everybody the, the, the formula on how to get a historic ship because they're not easy to get and they're difficult to maintain and, and it's a big challenge. And it, it's a real basic formula. I call it the triangle, the triangle of getting a historic ship. You're not going to get a berth or a pier without the ship and the money. You're not going to get the money without the ship and the pier. And you're not going to get a ship without the money and the pier. And if you can figure out how to solve that puzzle, you can figure out how to get a historic ship. I got a call uh, from the Port of Los Angeles that the executive director wanted to meet me for breakfast the following morning. Um, I kind of had little feelers a couple of weeks prior that they were being kind of quiet so I kind of knew something was up I didn't know exactly what it was um, but I you know went to that meeting hoping for the best you know I knew we had the best team I knew we had a best location uh, for the ship and I knew we could make this happen uh, when I actually sat down with the port executive director and she told me that the fact that the ship wasn't yet available for donation uh, and that she had contacted the public affairs officer of the Navy to confirm that, which it was confirmed through the public affairs office, that the ship actually was not up for bid at this point. Um, that was really disheartening. In what appeared to many people as going very fast, it was actually very a lot of years of lessons behind it and some relationships because a lot of stuff is done on relationships and so we got the bid process reopened again and we also laid out um, Robert laid out a strategy we talked about it and laid out a strategy that said hey we need to have a deep water berth that doesn't need dredging we need to have a pier that was already ready to accept us um, you know we there was four or five base objectives that we needed because if you had to do dredging it was going to be too difficult to pull off if you didn't have a perth it was going to be too difficult to pull off and we achieved them all with Berth 87 here and working with the city. And that was a challenge. I mean, it was a lot of work. Robert pulled a lot of weight and politically in, in pulling that together. He had been invited by the Central Neighborhood Council of San Pedro to give a presentation on the project. So we decided to go ahead and go to that presentation, even though the port had said no just two weeks prior to that. And overwhelmingly, everybody on that board decided to support this project. And from there, I was invited to the other four neighborhood councils around this port. And again, almost unanimous votes from every one of these councils, which is unheard of in this little tiny community of San Pedro and Wilmington, that they all agree pretty much on a project. Uh, so we really got 
uh, the wind blown back in our sails, we still did not have a yes. To, to overturn a no from the Port of LA is not something that is done very easily. Saving a battleship is definitely a lot of work. I think it was the uh, that community meeting, neighborhood council meeting that we had uh, just two weeks after we got that no. That was what kept me going. The, the community really came out and they wanted this project. So with that support, behind me as well as support of my family. Nobody was there with Robert. I mean, you know, I don't want to get all teary-eyed, but nobody has a clue as how hard that it, it is saving a ship. I was disheartened. Without a location, the project's dead. But I still knew that the Navy was probably going to put it out to bid, whether or not I would be able to be an applicant to go after it when it did finally come out to bid. I wasn't sure because without a spot, you can't put in an application. So at that point, I thought, yeah, we might miss the boat on this one. Because I did know eventually it was going to come out to bid or it was going to get scrapped. Either way, it looked like the Vallejo group had faltered and they weren't moving forward, they were moving backwards. So ultimately, she was either going to come out to bid or she was going to get scrapped probably. When I saw the work and everything that Robert was doing, I mean, because we would stay up late at night and I wasn't working when I met Robert and uh, and, and I was very privileged of that to, to just be by his side and help him. But, um, you know, I, I just saw the passion in Robert's eyes and, and I also was getting um, emails from, from some of the Iowa veterans and just asking, you know, why aren't you helping saving the Iowa and so forth. But, you know, to stay up late at night and, you know, and he'd say we have to go to Staples and, you know, and I was like, it's 11 o'clock at night. But, you know, I, I knew that my job was to be supportive of Robert. And, and I, I just not once did I think of not helping him. When I met with the mayor of Los Angeles, and within 15 minutes of telling him about this project that he tells me, what do I need from him to make this happen? And so now we're really starting to pick up steam. And it was only two months after that that we were able to turn that no into a unanimous full board decision by the Port of LA Harbor Commissioners that yes, that they would make space available. In fact, not any space, the space that we're at right now, the best spot I could have ever asked for in the Port of LA, right off the Vincent Thomas Bridge here, uh, highly visible to the people as they start coming down to the LA waterfront. Um, and three days later, I believe, is when our application was due to the Navy. Uh, prior to that, in May of 2009, the Navy actually put the ship back out to bid, so it took us six months to obtain some type of financing for the project, as well as the support from the port for a birth site, and uh, it was just in the nick of time. Um, all those little steps kept me moving in the forward direction. In May of 2011, we submitted our final application as well as Vallejo did, and then it was a waiting game to see which one was gonna be awarded the ship. Uh, we did not just sit around and wait. Uh, one of the things that was very crucial to me was that we needed to get the vessel open to the public as soon as possible. Uh, the Veterans Association had decided to hold their reunion here in San Pedro in the summer of 2012. And this is now summer of 2011, one year away. I had to decide, am I going all in on this or not? And I really figured the only way that we could get this open in July of 2012 is I had to basically commit everything that I had to make this thing happen. And I think that did go to the Navy when they were analyzing our application. They knew that we were already under contract with environmental groups to do our EIR. They knew we had already had architects hired to get the birth site, um, basically get the utilities designed and all those things, our ticket boost design. They knew we were already spending money before they even awarded us the ship. And I think that commitment showed the Navy that we really were the right group to make this happen. Standing here now, it's hard to believe that the future of this ship was once going to be shaped by the cutting torch and the wrecking ball. But just when all hope seemed to be lost, a letter arrived from the Navy. I got an email from the Navy asking me to be available on September 7th at 10 o'clock for a conference call. So of course I'm getting excited and I'm pretty sure that we're going to get the award. We've done everything we possibly could to make this thing happen um, and I felt that we were going to get the award and sure enough 
on the morning of September 7th, we get a phone call from the Navy and they awarded us the ship on that date. Now the, the cool part is, yeah, we got the ship. The hard part is on October 27th was the first extreme high, high tide in the fall up in Benicia. A lot of people don't realize this, but the ship could not be towed out of Benicia on any day. Caltrans built a bridge from Martinez to, Berni to Benicia uh, sometime mid-2000. They built this large bridge. Well, at that point where Sassoon Bay is, you have two rivers that converge on each other. I think it's the Sacramento River or the American River, one of those, Sacramento River probably, and uh, the San Joaquin River come together right at that bridge in Martinez and there's a sandbar right in the middle. It, it causes all the silt to build up in the middle. It also causes dynamic changes to the depth of the water in that area. So depending on what your runoff and your snow, your snowpack is in the Sierras every year, that water can move at a tremendous current, you know, four, four and a half, five knots, and cause massive deposits down in there. So we now had the transit over a shoal that on a normal day, we would have six feet of water that we would need more than the shoal. We would run into that shoal and not have six feet of clearance. So we had to wait for an extreme high, high tide to get her up and over that shoal. The problem is also this bay silts in about a foot every year. When we calculated our extreme high, high tide, we probably had six to nine inches to get it over the shoal this year. If we didn't get it out at this time, it would probably be silted in to the point where we would have to require dredging to get her over the shoal. And in California, dredging permits take years. And I knew that I don't think we could wait years to make this project happen. We needed to start earning revenues to start getting this project back on track as soon as possible. But we ended up getting uh, bathymetry data, uh, bathymetric data, to explore the depth of the water to get the ship out. And that would cost five, six thousand um, dollars. And we got a great deal from the, the folks that used us. It was Marine Surveyors, I think it was their name. And they, um, they came out and they gave us a whole map of the water. And when we gave that to the San Francisco uh, bar pilots, they looked at it and said, oh my gosh, the Iowa can really get out of Sassoon Bay. Um, but it was gonna have to go out at extreme high tide. It was gonna have to go out at a point that we had a tide that was seven feet. So we had seven weeks and we put a team together, um, Jonathan Williams, who's now the president of the group, and Mike Gesher, our director of operations, uh, went up there and formed a team and they actually had to close, I think it was 2,000 compartments to make her watertight so we could get her out of Benicia. And they had seven weeks to do that. Um, our goal date was October 27th or 28th, I don't remember offhand at this point, but we, uh, we said, we got to get her out on that day at, we had to cross the sandbar at 2.20 p.m. because that was extreme high tide and we'd have about a foot of water underneath her at that point. Um, but the aha light bulb on moment didn't really occur yet because we needed to raise $192,000 to tow her out of Benicia. And a lot of people don't realize this, but I was on the phone. I had exhausted my 401k that I pulled out to finance the project. I put in almost a half million dollars of my 401k to make this thing happen and I was tapped out. So I made calls to my stepmom and my friends. Uh, one of the other directors contacted some of his friends and at the very last moment, we had two hours I think the day before to get the money wire transferred to the company or they were canceling the tow. But we pulled it off. We got all the money raised, we got it into their bank and the next day, we're on the ship, and as they release the last cable tying us to this row of ships, and she was free again, and now moving down the channel, that last cable being let go, that was the light bulb aha moment. We got this ship, she's gonna get saved. That day was emotional when the ship finally moved and we got her out and went to Benicia and she creaked all night long. I mean, she hadn't moved for so many years, and she popped and creaked, and she heard the steel all night, and uh, it was charging. I mean, it was emotionally charging. It was uh, the culmination of so much work, so many people. There, there, the number of people that, that participated with all the groups, I mean, they're, they're, owed, they're owed so much appreciation. I don't think they've 
been appreciated the way they need to be. Uh, there was another really low moment um, after we got the ship to Richmond. Uh, we hadn't received the money from Iowa yet because it was uh, going to have to go back into legislation. Um, the Port of LA, the lease for this space looked like it was just getting really impossible to get this thing done. Uh, the money was getting to the point where I had nothing left. My credit cards were maxed out. I had $50,000 on my credit cards. My 401k was wiped out. Um, I turned down a couple of jobs working solely on this project for a couple of years because that's what it took to make this thing happen. Um, and it was getting to the point where it was really a low moment. We pulled into Richmond and we were broke. <laughs> we were absolutely broke. Uh, we, we just funded a tow and that took a lot to fund a tow and we had to figure out how to get it together real quick. And uh, I remember seeing they had a, a meeting on board the Iowa in Richmond that was a ceremony. I believe it was uh, April 19th. It was a ceremony for the 47 who lost their lives in turret uh, two. And there's a crewman on board, Mac McIntaggart. At the end of the video, they had asked him, you know, to say a few words, and he said a few words, and I was watching it, and it was very emotional for me, because I know how, you know, even though I wasn't here on the ship in 89, I know what that experience did to a lot of crew members, and how it hurt them so much, and scarred them, and changed them forever, that um, the emotions were pretty high. But at the end of his speech, and few words that he said, he said, now it's my job to get back to work, let's get this ship moving, and let's get this thing done. I'm a volunteer, I got a phone call, David Canfield, uh, who I, I served with in the Navy on this ship, found me in New York, and uh, asked me if I would help bring her back to, to life and help her get her ready for LA as a museum. And uh, I packed up my truck and I drove across the country and, and I've, been, <laughs> I've been flying back and forth ever since, but now I finally live here in California and uh, yeah, it's, this is part of my life and uh, I wanna help and it's almost like a giving back. And when I heard that, I realized I needed to get back up in my office and start going through the lease again and start reviewing it and seeing what I can come up with to try to make this project happen. So it was actually a crew member on board the Iowa that gave me that last push to get over that final hurdle. Uh, when I was basically at the end where I didn't know how I was going to proceed, how I could pull another ounce of energy to get back up there at two o'clock in the morning and continue working through the next presentation. Uh, it was that little spurt of energy and encouragement that I saw in his voice and in his face to start working on this ship that I needed to complete this job and get this done. A lot of people say, Mac, this is your ship. No, it's not my ship. This is our ship. Built by the people for the people. But we started working on it with whatever limited resources we have and we were waiting for uh, three million dollars from the state of Iowa to be able to fund the painting and the tow and the expenses to get her here and so we, we begged, borrowed, um, raised money, used the, the Battleship Expo to get everything put together from fuel to run the little generators to powering lights and you know just doing basic necessities. We did everything we could. We came together as a crew, as a family, as a community and and did everything we could to save the ship and put everything we could into it. I mean, we all, we all were tapping and, and maxing our credit cards to make this happen. We were able to acquire from the state of Iowa $3 million in a grant to really get the ship refurbished and get her looking the way you see her today. That was approved and we set that in motion about a year prior to this and it was a unanimous by the state legislature to allow the Iowa to get three million dollars of taxpayer money from the state of Iowa for this project. The only problem was there had some hiccups at some of the language and it got hung up in the bureaucracy. So we were sitting up there at the Port of Richmond uh, waiting for the money to come in so that we could refurb the ship and get her out and get her down here to LA and we actually had to go back to the state legislature in December and January for another resolution, another legislature law to get passed so we could actually get the money. So in the meantime, in order to be able to pay for our birth down there, we actually opened the Iowa uh, less than four months of acquiring her to the Port of Richmond 
and we opened her up on the weekends, what we call our mini tour alpha. And we had lots and lots of visitors, so sometimes a couple of thousand on the weekend, to be able to pay for our birth site while we were waiting for the money from the state of Iowa to come. Because I didn't even go home. I think for six months I didn't even go home to see my wife and kids. I had a second son that was now a year old at that point. My first son was, what, six years old, um, five years old. So I, you know, I was like, ah, well, yeah, I'll get home one day. Um, but my wife was extremely supportive and my kids were extremely supportive. I couldn't have done it without that. And, uh, and so the dedication of people and, and just the, the family, the family and the community coming together um, and saying, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna give this up. We're not gonna give the ship up. We're gonna fight and we're gonna fight to the end and we're gonna do everything we can to pull this together. And it doesn't matter what we have to commit ourselves to. I mean, these are just the everyday people that just show up on the street that would do it. This is not like some some crazy one-off or two-off type of people. It was everyday people that came together as, as a family. And I'm sure the veterans will tell you, I, this ship is very unique. I mean, it really, I, I've heard from folks that served in the 40s, 50s, and 80s how she's got a soul. And she really does have a soul. And she's got a happy soul. Um, the money came, finally, in February. At the end of February, we got the money. Now, unfortunately, that didn't leave us a lot of time to put in two and a half million dollars of refurb work to get her down here to LA looking like what we wanted to look her. Uh, we wanted her to leave under the Golden Gate Bridge in a condition that she looked like she was going back into service. So that means all new paint, uh, a lot of her weapon systems, the uh, missile systems, the uh, Gatling guns were all removed in the 90s as she decommissioned. So we actually had some manufactured here in Los Angeles and we were able to get her to look as if she was really ready to go back into service, including the radars at the top. And when she left the Golden Gate Bridge, you could see it flashed on CNN, beautiful photos and video of a ship that actually looked like she was going back into service. The days that stand out in my mind are the days when we towed out of Benicia, because those were the days I really didn't have to do anything. When I was in LA, I had to constantly have meetings to make sure the environmentals were on track, the building departments were on track, uh, this birth site was gonna be here, the lease was gonna be done. So in reality, those were the days I could actually stop, take my breath, and enjoy the moment. Um, towing away from that reserve fleet, uh, after being up there from 2006, helping the Vallejo group, watching the Iowa, you know, deteriorate over those years, you know, the inside I knew was in great shape, but the outside, you know, but again, my engineers told me, uh, Dick Langraf said, it's easy to just get that paint off. You put a new coat of paint on her, she'll look brand new. It's the inside that counted and the inside of the ship was in great shape. So, and sure enough, within three months, we were able to get the ship repainted, looking like she's ready to go to service. Uh, we got her down here um, just three days before we finalized our lease with the Port of Los Angeles, she arrived. And she couldn't come into port yet because there's a new law that went into effect about five years back in California that said you, if a ship is in a port in California for more than five years, and the Iowa had been up in San Francisco Bay for 10, she can't go to another California port unless she had the hull cleaned from any invasive species. So for the first time in over 20 years, an Iowa-class battleship, we powered up one of our generators that we brought on board for the trip. We boarded the ship off of about six miles off the coast, and we powered up her anchor and we lowered the anchor in 600 feet of chain and we actually rode at anchor for four days prior to coming into the port. Uh, it is pretty cool, finally, of all these battleships I've been on in the 20 years I've been working on these projects, I've never looked out of the wardroom, the officer's wardroom that has a door on each side of the ship and see nothing but water. And that was an experience, to see water on both sides as she gently rolled in the, in the swells that were coming in. Those four days was really special. Um, on day four, after the hull had been cleaned, uh, we got the tugs came back out and we actually came into the port of LA and we tied up at an outer harbor berth because I wanted to be able to put a lot of people who helped make this project happen, ride the Iowa down this main channel on June the 9th. And we actually boarded about a thousand people on board this ship and we were able to be towed down the ship 
down the main channel, underneath the Vincent Thomas Bridge, turn her around, and then actually come up to birth 87 where you see right now. So that was really a special day for a lot of people who had put in a lot to make this project happen. It was tremendously emotional. I mean, it was a, it was a collision of, of past thoughts and, and the future of what we had to do to get it open. Um, but it was, it was really special. There was a sign on the, uh, on the fence that said, USS Iowa, welcome to your new home. And I thought, you know, that, that was really special. Uh, we uh, were able to get the ship ready to go and open it up to the public. Uh, in less than four weeks later, uh, the Iowa veterans arrived and I worked out with the fire department and the Environmental Protection Agency a way that we could actually turn the ship over to the veterans. Unlike today where you have a very guided path, a tour path, and we only have about 15% of the ship opened up to the public, we actually uh, were able to turn the entire ship over to the crew. We had to station about 40 people in special places throughout the ship with radios and safety gear, but they could come on board the ship on July, I think, 3rd and July 5th, and they were able to go back to their old places, their old bunks. And that week is what really made all the sacrifices, both financially and of time and uh, of my family that I had to put in for four years, that week the thank yous that I got from the crew members coming back on the ship, it made everything worth it. And I knew I did something that absolutely was the right thing to do. When they left on July the 5th, the crew got a break. They all went home, probably got some sleep, and we actually officially opened to the public on July 7th, less than 10 months after we were awarded the ship. In contrast, the USS Wisconsin was donated and uh, in March of 2007 to the city of Norfolk and it took them three years to work out the EPA and the Navy requirements and then it took another year and a half to actually get the ship open to the public so it took almost five years to get the ship opened up and we did it in literally less than 10 months and that's a tribute to the crew. It was amazing it was uh, it was a really odd sense of deja vu and uh, and uh, a sense of how much work still lay in front of us as Pacific Battleship Center to get her open. It was uh, uh, truly the past and the future in great collision. My job working with technology um, is to try to bring as much of the ship to life for the visitors to see as we possibly can. And that's really what I want to see. I want to see the ship uh, not just as a, as a museum that's dull and boring, but as something that's alive and, and interesting. You know, our first year we had about 300 and what was it, 325,000? Now, in museums, attractions, the second year always is horrible. First year is a big boost, it's exciting, so on and so forth. The second year, it dropped by like 40%. It was horrible. <laughs> and then the third year, you know, we started to say, oh, how is this going to go? And really, it starts to drive some of your strategy decisions and what you're doing uh, in the future. Uh, so we looked at the second year and said, ooh, if this keeps dropping, we're not going to be a, you know, an entity that can maintain this. And so you just start to say, what do we do? She's a World War II battleship. I mean, across the country, the relevance of World War II battleships and World War II ships is no longer relevant. As generations have gotten younger, um, you know, the, the younger generations are into mobile phones and games and theme parks and, you know, and a World War II battleship. And, is not the highlight of their life anymore. And so you have to sit down and really think about that conversation, that discussion, and say, oh, wow, who are we? Well, we're an 887-foot ship that's sitting in salt water that's going to want to rust and deteriorate, and how are we going to make sure this doesn't occur, you know, very quick? And so we have to look and say, how are we going to do that? How are we going to get our attendance up? And how are we going to boost it? And, uh, and so we looked at it and said, you know, we need to be a community platform. Yes, we are a big gunship, and I hate to say it, but in Los Angeles, a big gunship is not the most friendly conversation, to be truthful. Um, but she's got a legacy, and she's a community platform, and it has for worldwide. I, I like to say when folks come in and go, wow, all of this ship to kill people. No, it's all of this ship to keep the peace. Something of this size, it, it's about the projection of power to prevent things from happening. It can be used in that sense, but most of the time it's to prevent them. And so all of this ship was designed and built to, compete, to, to keep the peace um, to some extent. And so we're, the way I look at it is we're a community platform. 
and the, and the volunteers started showing up. Hundreds of volunteers started showing up. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing, and it still is amazing. And to this day, I have not heard any negative feedback of anybody that comes on board to visit the Iowa. They all think it's great. The kids love it. The kids really do, you know, and it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And, and it's not only is it good for the country, it's good for the people because it's a part of freedom. You know, the Statue of Liberty, where I'm from in New York, I mean, that's a great symbol of freedom, but what did it do for your freedom, right? The Arch in St. Louis did nothing for your freedom. Mount Rushmore, great place, landmark in South Dakota, didn't do anything for your freedom. Neither did the Brooklyn Bridge or the Golden Gate, but this ship did. And, uh, and I'm proud to have been a part of her, and I'm proud to, have, to be able to say her story again. And uh, coming aboard today, and going back to my old metalsmith shop and seeing my name chiseled on the workbench that we did, well, it just it was pretty tough to take. And putting, I mean, right now it is, but putting my hands on equipment that I used when I was 18, 19 years old, and slabs there where I was welding stuff. And there's some wells on this ship that I welded that I still see. And I'm so proud of that that it will be on this ship till the end. This is a dedication of the Veterans Association Museum aboard the battleship Iowa. The plaque reads, the Veterans Association of the USS Iowa Museum, dedicated to all officers and enlisted crew members who served aboard this great ship. In memory of Stephen F. Haas Sr., proud plant owner of the USS Iowa. This has been made possible by the generous donations of the family of Stephen F. and Dolly Haas. So we're going to go place this right now. We invite you guys. I know that it's been open all week, but I, we invite you to come and see it again and then uh, enjoy the rest of your time here at the reception. Thank you very much. Okay. We're a community platform um, that is here for the community to enjoy it and be part of it. You know, we've got tourists, but we also have local community. And so we started changing the direction of it. We said, okay, we're a community platform. We're going to always be authentic about what we do. We're going to be authentic in telling the American story because the first story that always brews to the top is the story of veterans, right? And this was a funny conversation. Um, but David Canfield and I, one of our earliest conversations that we really got into it is I told him he wasn't our target audience and he got upset at me. He goes, well, I'm a veteran. I'm your target audience. I said, no, you're not. You're going to come to this ship no matter what. I don't have to spend money to advertise to you to come aboard this ship because you're going to show up. It's the families. It's the families that are going to change it. I mean, how many veterans do you have? LA is, I think, 7% of the population's veterans. I'm not going to spend all the money to market to 7%. I'm going to spend the money to market to the majority because they're the ones that are really going to drive attendance in dollars. Um, so, it, it, you know, you start to look at that and say, okay, what's going to do that? Programs, you know, education programs. Let's get kids. Kids have one of the greatest mouths and marketing mouthpiece on, of mankind so we can get kids to talk about it. So let's get kids on board. Let's get them talking about it. Let's give them an enjoyable time. Let's give mom an enjoyable time. I mean, this is a battleship. Dad can come on and have fun all day long, but if mom and the kids aren't having fun, then you might as well just say goodbye to that because uh, that's going to kill that you know, from the minute it happens. So let's have mom having fun. Let's have the kids having fun, and then dad will naturally have fun. And so we're able to support our friends and our partners in their efforts to raise money, but in doing so, we're able to raise the awareness of the Iowa and the awareness of how important the Iowa is as a, as a um, platform for American ingenuity, engineering, innovation. Uh, you know, like I said, you got veterans that served on board, but what about the people that built it? What about the proud Americans that built it? What about the proud Americans that modernized it? What about the proud Americans that mothballed it? What about the ones that designed it? What about the ones that still continue to, to maintain it today? I mean, that's a story of, of proud Americans. That's a story of community. That's a story of coming together to do something greater for our country. Um, so I see everybody as a piece of this story and as that we're that community platform telling that. And, and when we set that strategy in place a couple years ago, we didn't know how that strategy would pan out. But today we're up about 25 percent. Um, we see, we'll see 220, 250,000 people in attendance this year. And uh, while we're not booming per se we're not we're, we're doing fine I'm constantly asked what's it like to come back uh, and the closest answer I can give you is it's like coming home uh, it's uh, 
If you've ever gone back to your parents' house after being gone for decades, and it's not really your house anymore because you don't live there, but it's still very comfortable and you grew up there and you don't have any problem grabbing something out of the fridge and making yourself at home, that's what it feels like to be back here. It sometimes makes tears come to my eyes. It's hard to explain, I can't explain it, but there's a fondness you grow towards a ship like the Iowa. The experiences of a boy that you, you had on that ship brings back the memories of old friends. Uh, just a flood of me emotions run through you. Uh, last, I saw it three years ago when it was just moved here and uh, I just want to sit down and cry looking at it. I first saw her again in 2012 when she pulled here into San Pedro and we had the big reunion and the opening for a museum. Uh, and it, it, there was a feeling like of coming home, a feeling of familiarity, but then at the same time, I couldn't, re at first I couldn't remember where my bunks were um, and, and things like that. So there was, there was a lot of different feelings, but most of it was pride. Cause I was like, I, I was be able to look at this ship and say, I served on board this ship. Well, I'm glad it's being saved and preserved. It's a lot of work to maintain a ship like this. Veterans were a very important component of serving on board. But to me, the Iowa is not a story of just the Iowa. It really is not a story of just the Iowa. We've had three presidents that served on board. Did they, st or have come aboard, and I guess they served on board, being on board for the temporary time. But it's, it, it, the story is different than that, right? You have FDR on board that goes to the, the, the um, Tehran Conference, Tamir El Kabir, Casablanca. Can you imagine what would have happened if we didn't have D-Day? Can you imagine if this ship didn't transport FDR over there? Can you look at all of those pieces of American history and all of those pieces of American innovation? Uh, well, we have a 35 knot ship that, that we sit on. The, the design and aerodynamics of this ship established the groundwork for the design and engineering of future aircraft carriers and future ships. This is, this is the mother of today's warships. I mean, it really is for, for today's. There's a reason why the SS United States, not even warships, but the SS United States as a um, as a cruise ship and a transport ship, a, a liner, an ocean liner. She remained classified until the 80s. Why? She had the same boilers and engines that the Iowa had on board her. She, she held speed records. The Iowa is something that changed the evolution of the world. It really did. Uh, internet's changed it. Oil changed things. The car changed things. This ship, the design of the Iowa-class battleships, completely change the future of, of warfare and the future of ships and the future of, of the way things were designed and built and engineering and computers and all of those elements and it's all embodied in one ship and so you have to tell that story because truthfully that's the story she's got a lot of history she served she's got amazing commanding officers she's got an amazing history of veterans that served on board here but that's a piece of the story we've got to focus on america America as a country and how um, this has changed the way we think about engineering and in international trade and industrial uh, manufacturing and you're, this is what this stands for. This is history and to be able to tell that story to future generations, future generations can connect to that. It gives relevance for connection. Um, and that's the important element. Technology evolves. This was at the forefront of its technology. Technology will continue to evolve, but you need to have that, that foundation of technology, and it sits right here. There's a lot of people in our armed services and in Congress that are concerned that if in the event of a national emergency, that we may need these big guns again to protect our Marines going ashore in amphibious landing. So, from that standpoint, we pray that she never has to go back into service because those circumstances would be, you know, not good circumstances for anybody under those terms. But um, it does give people who walk on board the ship a little bit, a little of an air that, you know, this is not quite yet a museum ship. Uh, and, and even after 2020, the Navy's contract, if there is ever a national emergency, the Navy can always come in and take her back. Never give up. Always keep pushing. Perseverance is big. Keep your dream alive. Um, be willing to commit yourself completely to, to achieving your dream if you, that's what you really want to achieve. And don't stop. Just risk it. Keep risking. I mean, as long as you're doing the right thing, 
as long as you're not trying to, to hurt somebody or cheat somebody and you're always doing the right thing because you know today I'm lucky enough I get in the paper with all kinds of things all the time but you know what we're doing the right thing we're not doing anything to harm anybody and at the end of the day I know we're doing our best to tell the story because I know we're keeping it authentic and I know we're doing the right thing in doing so and I know we're always working to achieve that and and so people could think whatever they want. And that's our goal now is to start getting more and more of the ship available to the public but all that takes money we've got to make it safe a lot of the ladders that are here are just too steep so we're trying to make it safe we want to be able to get um, ADA accessibility so we can get uh, people with disabilities on board the ship and be able to enjoy the ship also. Right now we're not ADA accessible. Uh, it's a warship, so it's gonna take us a little while to convert her. So that's, that's kind of our goals, is to get the ship more accessible and then also start a lot of our children education programs, our overnight programs. The veterans tell a very uh, a great fun story, the scuttlebutt of veterans, that's what got me involved. I mean, that's what puts me in tears, is the scuttlebutt of veterans, because that's a very human story and we we try to capture as much as that can and that's very important in telling the story of the ship is that human story and that scuttlebutt per se and, and guests love it but kids are going to be connected to the engineering and kids today that mobile phones everything do you think getting a kid on board this ship is going to you know let me let me go you want to go hear a, a, a 50 or 80 year old sailor come tell you a story and i hate to say it but a 10 year old kid's going to be oh I have to deal with my grandpa every Sunday, right? I, I, this is not what they're going to want to do. But if a kid can come on board and be introduced to this, then we can do it in a way that they say, oh, wow, that's cool. I found Vicky. I use my mobile phone. I can't believe, oh, it was so cool. It's like a giant bat toy or whatever they want to say, right? Now the kid is intrigued. The kid is interested. And now they start to go, wow, I can't believe this. Wow, look at that. that, that technology. I can't believe they were able to design this. You know, I want to go into a career of designing something because this is really, this changed the world. We were able to influence that. We were able to change the way that, that young person looked at the way the world exists and the future of the world. And if we can do that, we all know when they hit their 30s and 40s, they look back and go, I can't believe that that was one of the best experiences of my life. And the day they had the experience, they probably, th you know, they may have been excited, but they weren't thinking about the history element. But 30, 20, 30 years later, it influenced their, their entire future. What we've accomplished is incredible uh, and a testament to the crew and the management and the leadership of this project. And it's just going to keep getting better and better. I would like the Iowa one day to be the number one naval warship museum in the world. That, that's what I hope for the Iowa. The writing was on the wall for the battleship, probably from the moment the first person leaned over the side of a biplane and dropped a bomb. But the great navies of the world didn't understand that then, for in the battleship resided the pride, the strength and the power of those forces and the nations they protected. By the advent of true naval air power with the aircraft carriers of the Second World War, the writing could be read. Battleships such as the Tirpitz and the Bismarck scuttled around from one hiding place to another until they finally made it out into open ocean, where they were hunted down and torpedoed. The USS Iowa survived mainly because she'd been designed from the very start to keep up with those fast aircraft carriers. However, the Navy cancelled the class of superfast battleships that were due to replace the Iowa, making this the last great battleship and therefore the last American supership.